topic is on minerals, and I'm focusing on three minerals in particular, zinc and iron and calcium. And March is actually Nutrition Month, and the theme this year is uh, meeting women's nutritional needs. And I thought that it wouldn't be fair just to talk about women's needs, because there are some men in the audience too. So I thought that it would be good to talk about um, some minerals that affect both men and women. Okay, so just continuing with our discussion about zinc, um, I wanted to talk about zinc because if a person is low in zinc intake, what can happen is a reduced um, taste sensitivity. So your food may not taste as well. And it can also lead to a poor appetite. Okay, and in turn a poor appetite might mean eating less and then the zinc efficiency could get worse and worse from not eating. So if you find that you don't have a very good appetite, you might just look to see if you are getting food sources of zinc. Zinc is also important in wound healing. If you if you've injured yourself and you have a cut or something, um, zinc really helps it to heal faster. If you have a, a, um, wounds that take a long time to heal, zinc might be something that you want to look at in your diet. Okay, so those two things, taste sensitivity and wound healing, are what zinc are especially important for. Um, and you were asking what food sources um, contain zinc. And zinc is found in a wide variety of foods, but it's especially high in animal products. Okay, so um, things like roast beef, for instance, has, has zinc in it. Um, also, oysters are very high in zinc. And clams are high in zinc, so if you enjoy clam chowder, that's great. Um, salmon also contains zinc, too. And uh, salmon also contains the other two minerals that we're going to talk about today, calcium and iron. So salmon's a good thing to be eating. Um, chicken and pork also contain zinc, as, as do most meat products. Okay? Um, and I mentioned earlier that whole wheat bread um, provides us with zinc, and white bread has half as much zinc as the whole, whole grain bread does. So the whole grain bread is a much better choice. Um, peas also contain zinc, so if you like your peas, enjoy them. <coughs> yeah, they have zinc in them. Um, bananas, somebody asked about bananas last time, they provide zinc. Also nuts and um, uh, milk, milk um, contains a certain amount of zinc. <coughs> and so do beans. Beans provide us with zinc. Wide variety of foods. Um, it, zinc is higher in the animal foods than, than in the plant foods, as a general rule. And some of our seafood is especially high in zinc, such as our oysters and salmon and clams. So I hope those are all things that you enjoy eating. Okay, I mentioned that. Um, Food processing can reduce the amount of zinc in our diet. So it's a good idea to try to not um, eat only processed flours, but to try to enjoy some whole grain flours as well. Something that increases the excretion of zinc is alcohol. So if you're drinking alcohol on a regular basis, um, it, that may be interfering with the amount of zinc that your body is retaining. So it's a good idea to drink alcohol in moderation. Not only for all of the other reasons that you hear about, we talked about heart health last week, but, or last month, but um, lots of other reasons too. Um, and if, if a person has liver disease, um, cirrhosis for instance, sometimes zinc um, is, is compromised in the diet. Okay, so zinc, important for wound healing and um, taste sensitivity. Okay, the next mineral that I'd like to talk about is iron. And um, this, this is a concern for women, but it's also a concern for, for men, too. Um, there are lots of things that can affect the absorption of iron um, in our bodies. Can anybody think of any of those? What things affect iron absorption? Hmm, that's a tricky question. 
Okay, um, one that is especially important for seniors is um, the acidity of your stomach makes a difference. If a person's stomach isn't acidic enough, um, then iron might not, not be absorbed as well. And sometimes seniors have problem, um, a problem called achlorhydria, uh, where they're, they have a very basic um, stomach. It's not very acidic. Um, so that can affect iron absorption. And that's one reason why it's good to avoid taking antacids in, in excess. Uh, because if you take too many antacids, then your stomach isn't acidic enough to help that iron to be absorbed. Okay? And an excess amount of antacids can also lead to a rebound effect where if you if you're taking them, you know, for a long time and then all of a sudden you stop taking them, the um, the stomach acidity can go way up. And I actually have an article here that I um, brought on um, on antacids, and I'm going to hang it up on the bulletin board afterwards um, because there's some interesting information here about antacids, and I'll talk a little bit more about them when we come to calcium. Okay, are any of you taking antacids? Say once a month or more. Some, some people take them really often, and it's good to be aware of some of the problems that can occur from that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Something else that can affect the absorption of iron in the body is um, something called chelating agents. And those are things in our foods that we, we might be eating that would bind to iron and make it not um, as readily absorbed. And one of those things is actually calcium. So you may notice that on a lot of um, multiple, vita um, um, multiple vitamin mineral supplements, often the amount of calcium is very high. And the reason, or one of the reasons, is because if it was high, then that would reduce the amount of iron that was absorbed. Um, Oxalic acids in um, things like spinach and rhubarb can also reduce the amount that's absorbed, but it's, it's not usually a big problem for people. Something called phytic acid that's found in whole grains and um, oats and, and um, cereals can also reduce the amount of iron that's absorbed. But I thought that it was interesting that. Breads that are made with yeast as a leavening agent, um, the iron will be better absorbed from those because there's something in it, in the yeast, that destroys the phytic acid. Okay, and it's the phytic acid that binds with the iron. So, um, leaven, yeast leavened breads are a good thing. And uh, the iron will usually be better absorbed from those than non leavened breads. reduce the absorption of iron. Now, um, an article that I was just reading um, said that it's very rare for people to get an iron deficiency just because they happen to drink tea. So tea can be part of a healthy diet, but it's just something to be aware of. You know, if the only um, uh, source of um, iron that you're getting is while you're drinking tea, then, then you might think of eat, having your tea at a different time. Day. Okay. Um, it, uh, and one study found that drinking tea with a meal makes uh, decreases iron absorption by about 62%. So I thought that was really interesting. Coffee also can reduce iron absorption, but it doesn't have as great an effect on reducing the amount of iron that's absorbed. Okay, so we've talked about things that can reduce iron absorption. We want to know what can help increase iron absorption, don't we? Okay, I think I'll, I'll um, just stop here, first of all, to explain that there are di two different types of iron um, in the food sources that we, we eat. And one is called heme iron, and that's the iron that's found in animal sources, such as our uh, roast beef and pork. 
A and that type of thing. And then there's also non-heme iron, which is found in vegetables and grains. And the heme iron from animal products is actually absorbed much more readily than the non-heme iron is. But there are some things that can help us to increase the absorption of the non-heme iron. And um, um, one that's very important is actually vitamin C in the diet. It makes a really big in, um, difference as to the amount of non-heme iron that will be absorbed. So and a good example would be, for instance, if you're having um, toast with your breakfast and you want that iron that's in the toast to be better absorbed, drinking some orange juice with it or having a piece of grapefruit or strawberries with it will help that iron to be absorbed better. So, and um, I brought along uh, an orange. We often think of oranges as having a lot of vitamin C in them, and they definitely do, but uh, green peppers are also very high in vitamin C, and red peppers are even higher. So if you like your red and green peppers, that's great too. You might want to put some in a sandwich, for instance. Yeah, or in a salad. Yeah, that's a great idea. Or in an omelet. Yeah. And just um, one more thing about vitamin C before we carry on. Is that vitamin C is readily um, destroyed if it's exposed to air um, or if it's exposed to a lot of heat over time. So if you're um, preparing your um, juice, for instance, and it, you're storing it in the refrigerator, it's a really good idea to keep it uh, covered on it. Otherwise, the air will be ex exposed to it, and it can destroy the vitamin C in it. Okay, and also avoiding overcooking your vegetables. Having raw vegetables, like raw green peppers, is, is a good idea. There will be more vitamin C in a raw green pepper than a cooked one. Yeah, raw green paper, raw celery, raw carrots is very, very good. Yes. But yeah. not the choppers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be tricky to, yeah. um, to eat raw vegetables if, if you have problems with your teeth. But um, something that I suggest, for instance, with carrots, if you have a hard time chewing uh, on a hard carrot, try grating them instead. Yes, yeah. but sometimes we'll get lazy. <laughs> <laughs> lazy. still lazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't oh, even got the same flavor as the, uh, the whole carrot. Yeah. Uh, avoid some modifying vegetables if you're avoiding them because they're too hard. That's really important. Well, we're not avoiding them, but okay, it's a okay. necessity that doesn't allow us, in, I mean, to say, well, every time you think of a raw carrot to eat it well, you have to think twice. You know, water, you really want it. <laughs> yes, you want it, huh? Yeah. You can do it. Actually, um, next month is is cancer month and I thought it would be a lot of fun to look at um, cancer prevention next month and one thing that's really being promoted a lot is a really um, um, increase in the amount of fruits and vegetables that people are eating so I think we'll we'll talk more about that next month about ways of getting more fruits and vegetables into our diet but as far as vitamin C goes you know if you find that um, you're having trouble eating, you know, for instance, a whole orange. Just putting it in slices might be an idea. Um, or no, the oranges are okay. The peppers, the celery. <laughs> oh, they're the problem. Yeah. Chop them up. Okay. Well, I chop them up. Okay, good. You're, then you're getting some exercise. That <laughs> yeah, my arm gets an exercise, not the, That's right. <laughs> not the body. Okay. okay. Um, so we're, we're, where were we here as far as talking about uh, iron? If, if you are <coughs> drinking tea, this thing study that I was telling you about that showed that tea with a meal can reduce the iron that's absorbed. If you're having lemon juice in your tea, um, the, the um, lemon has uh, um, vitamin C in it, so the iron from your food will be better absorbed than if your tea did have lemon juice in it. So if you like lemon juice in your tea, that's good. Okay. Um, a couple of other things that can help increase the absorption of iron from our non-heme sources um, are um, by having a source of meat or fish or poultry with it, that can also help. 
So again, if you're having a piece of um, um, bread, for instance, the iron will be better absorbed if you were to have um, a piece of meat on it. And it's not because of the iron in the meat, but there's amino acids in the meat, um, or fish or poultry, that helps that iron in, in the um, bread or toast be better absorbed. Okay. Now, why are we so concerned about iron? I told you all the things that can help increase absorption and decrease absorption, but um, a, a low iron intake can lead to what? Do you, anybody know what? Anemia. I think something called anemia. That's right. Yeah, if it goes on for a long time without getting enough iron in the body. Um, iron is a large component of our blood, and blood helps um, circulate oxygen through all of the cells in our body. So if we are, we're low in iron, it can actually make us feel very fatigued and tired and, and lifeless. So it's important to get enough iron in, in the body. And you might also know, notice that a person will look more pale. It's, um, it's, it's important that the iron be there for your blood stored. Okay, and a survey that had been done, actually it was a few years ago, but um, it showed that vulnerable groups um, in our society tend to be um, women aged 10 to 64 who aren't getting enough iron. Some of you may be over age 64, but keep in mind also that people on weight reducing diets often don't get enough iron or calcium. So if you're restricting your calories too much, um, or if you're overweight and feel that you need to lose some weight, really make sure that you're not excluding foods that are high in, in iron and calcium. Okay. Now an overload isn't good either, so it's important that we have a balance. And um, too much iron can be actually toxic and lead to liver damage. And some new studies are, are showing that an excess amount of iron may lead to heart disease too. So just to, to caution you about taking supplements, it's always good to talk to your doctor and discuss with your doctor whether or not you should be taking a supplement and how much to be taking. Okay, so some sources of iron. Um, I mentioned that the heme iron um, is better absorbed. So iron that's um, in liver, for instance, we always hear about liver being a high source. Um, but our roast beef, again, um, meat sources, turkey, chicken, um, um, also fish has, has iron in it. Um, the red meat tends to have more iron than white meat does. So if you're, you're choosing between white and dark meat on your turkey, the dark meat will have more iron in it. Okay. But there are also lots of um, vegetable sources that contain iron. Things like our uh, baked beans, again, that we saw that they were high in zinc, but um, beans also contain iron as well. So it's handy to have some canned or, or even the dry ones to, for making things like chilies or um, soups are really nice too. Or um, something like burritos with beans in them. Really tasty. Okay, dried fruit, things like prunes have a lot of iron in them. Um, dried apricots also do too. Okay. Um, split peas have, have a lot of iron in them. Um, even peanut butter and whole our whole grains again are also high in iron. Okay. So for vegetables that are higher in iron, I mentioned um, um, prune juice and dried fruits, but as far as vegetable goes, um, things like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, beans, asparagus, and beet greens are also very high in iron, so I hope you enjoy those. Um, milk um, and dairy products aren't a good source of iron. They don't contain a lot of iron, but it's, they're important for another reason, and that's calcium. So I think that um, that's all that I wanted to mention about iron, and um, so we can continue to talk about um, that the last mineral that's on our agenda today, and that's calcium. Okay, any questions about iron before we head on? You, you know it all now, yeah. <laughs> right. Actually, I have just a, a few tips here for adding iron into your diet. Um, and I'll, I'll go through a few of them because it can, it can really make a difference just by 
being aware of food sources of iron, and adding little bits here and there. And um, for people who have um, um, a low level of hemoglobin in their blood, um, we, we have a sheet on, um, of information called Iron Works that you might be interested in. And it discusses the different <laughs> sources of iron, but it also has some tips on the back for increasing um, iron intake. And one thing um, that we do suggest is that infant um, cereals are fortified with uh, a type of iron that's very readily absorbed. And that's why we encourage it for infants up to the age of two years, um, because they may have a difficult time getting enough iron in otherwise. But also for adults, too, and seniors, there's no um, problem with adding infant um, iron-fortified cereals, putting it into different things, like your regular cereals, mixing it in to put in sure, that type of thing. Um, or mixing it in with applesauce and yogurt. Okay. Um, snacking on nuts and seeds or dried fruit can, can help increase your iron intake. Adding spinach or broccoli to salads is a really good idea. Um, and also having salads with beans in them, like kidney beans or garbanzo beans, that type of thing, can be good too. Um, sardines have iron in them. Um, so having either sardines or maybe peanut butter has iron in it on um, on crackers as a snack. Maybe another idea. Molasses has a fair amount of iron in it too, and molasses also contains calcium. Um, it also contains a, a fair amount of sugar. So for those who are diabetic, it's good to be aware of that. But um, you know, if you are having putting some molasses in your muffins, for instance, that will help increase the amount of iron in your diet. Um, put, using it in things like gingerbread or baked beans. Um, okay. Have you, have you ever heard of the drink called Ovaltine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. There's, they've actually added iron into that. And um, it, it can be another source of iron. Um, or prune juice is a good idea. Lots of iron in that. Good thing to be drinking um, for with breakfast rather than a lot of tea and coffee which is going to reduce your iron absorption. Uh, and then including foods that have a lot of vitamin C in with your meals. Um, now, somebody had asked about my cast iron frying pan here. I can't go on to, to keep talking about calcium. I'm so waiting. Okay, you've waited patiently. Okay, what I wanted to say about cast iron frying pans is that they can be a source of iron in the diet, too. You might be surprised to hear that, but... Um, I've yeah. yeah. heard about it, that's why I asked you. Yes. And I wanted you to confirm it. Yes, right. it is true. <laughs> yeah, by um, cooking food in a cast iron frying pan, um, some of the iron does um, get released and, and um, can be eaten along with the food. And it's especially true if you're cooking something that's fairly acidic in your um, pan. Um, something like tomato sauce would helps to leach out more iron, um, for instance. So. Just if you have a cast iron frying pan at home and you're wondering about it, it's, it's a good thing to, to be using. I love this stews. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Great stews. Yeah. 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 That's good pot. Somebody, um, I'm not trying to promote frying here at all. I'm going to talk about how to get back on fat so last month and for prevention of heart disease. But for cooking, you know, sauces or for poaching or whatever. That's what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> um, topic, mineral that I'd like to cover is um, on calcium. And I'd like to focus specifically on osteoporosis because it's, it's um, quite a concern for us in um, today's society. And it's estimated that one in four um, Canadian women over the age of 65 suffers from osteoporosis. Okay. And it's really a disease to try to prevent at an earlier age, if possible. But um, even at a later age, it is, uh, they, have, they feel that it is possible to slow down the pro progress of osteoporosis. And what it is, is um, osteo means um, bone, and porosis means porous. So osteoporosis means porous bones. And um, calcium is, um, of all the minerals, it's the one that's in our body in the highest quantity, and it's stored in our bones. 99% of the calcium in our body is in the bone. Um, 
and about 1% is in, in the blood, for instance. And our blood needs a certain amount of calcium in it, and um, it, if we're not getting enough from our diet, what will happen is the um, blood will get that calcium from the bones, and, and calcium can leach out and eventually lead to um, porous brittle bones, which can, can um, really lead to pain and suffering, um, fractured hips, for instance. People who have osteoporosis that fall often will um, break a bone, so that can be very painful. So really important to, to get enough calcium in the diet for our skeletons. Okay, um, they do feel that low calcium intake may be um, associated with reduced bone mass. So by making sure that we're getting enough calcium in our diet can be one way of helping to, to prevent it. Um, it's interesting that um, that there's a continual turnover of calcium in the body. Our bones aren't just a static thing, and um, calcium continues to be absorbed into bones and then released into blood, and um, the, the peak bone mass that occurs in, um, in people is at about age 35. Okay, so our bones are continually building up till about that age, and then after that, they, the, they tend to um, um, release more calcium than they absorb. And because osteoporosis tends to, to run in families, if you feel that uh, you have osteoporosis or, or at risk, you might just remind your, your daughter and your grandchildren, your granddaughters especially, um, that um, it's important to get calcium, enough calcium at a young age. But, but even later on, they feel that getting enough calcium can help slow down the progression. Um, risk factors for osteoporosis, but I, again, I just want to emphasize that um, you know, not enough calcium isn't good, but excess amounts of calcium aren't good either. So if you're taking supplements, it's always good to know how much to take and whether or not you should be taking them. And um, excess calcium can actually lead to kidney stones or to um, calcium being deposited in the soft tissues, which isn't good either. So. That's, that's the thing about nutrition, um, you know, some is good, excess isn't necessarily better. Okay, so one thing that you can do is sort of ass assess your risk uh, of whether you may be at risk for developing osteoporosis. Um, and I, I've been talking about women, but some men do get osteoporosis. It's much more common in women, but it can be a concern for men too. So there are some genetic factors. You, you might ask um, um, if yourself, if you're Oriental or Caucasian, those people tend to be at a greater risk. Um, if you have a family history of osteoporosis in the family, that can also increase your risk. And for women who have gone through menopause, there tends to be an increased risk. Um, sudden drop in estrogen that occurs during menopause, they feel. Um, is a contributing factor for uh, releasing calcium from the bones for some reason. <coughs> um, there's some personal risk factors that you might want to look at as well. Um, first set that we looked at were genetics. And you can't really do a lot about your genetics, but there are, there are personal risk factors we have more control over. So um, exercise is one of them. And you can ask yourself if you exercise less than three times a week, and by exercise, um, with the studies have shown that with osteoporosis, the type of exercise that's needed um, to help calcium uh, remain in, in our bone structure is weight-bearing exercise where you're um, doing things like um, um, walking or things like skiing or even cycling. Um, you're, you're, you'd be bearing some weight there. Walking is excellent. Swimming actually isn't a oh, weight bearing <laughs> exercise. Were you like, oh, oh, good, you're saying. <laughs> okay. Yeah, swimming isn't as good um, for preventing osteoporosis as walking is. Um, it's something to do with the bones and, and the effect of bearing weight on your bones that helps the calcium be, um, remain in your bones. So try to keep that in mind. I mean, exercise is so good for a lot of other reasons too, but for, for your bones, it's a, it's a really healthy thing too. Okay. 
it's good not to overdo exercise though either, especially for people who are underweight. Um, they have found that people who have, um, that are underweight tend to be at a greater risk of developing osteoporosis, okay, thinner bone structure. Okay. Their, their bone mass tends to be a little bit weaker and uh, just less dense. Another personal risk factor is whether or not you smoke. And um, smoking can actually lead to an earlier menopause and they have found that it increases estrogen metabolism. So they feel that that's the reason that smoking, <coughs> two of the reasons that smoking can contribute to osteoporosis. Um, taking any of the following medications. Uh, Anticonvulsants, um, large doses of thyroid hormone, adrenal steroids, or aluminum containing antacids. And um, aluminum binds with calcium so that it can't be absorbed. So if you're taking antacids that have a lot of aluminum in it, it can, um, can lead to problems. And I discussed earlier that um, antacids lower the acidity in the stomach. And calcium, as well as iron, needs iron in the, or, um, needs acidity in the stomach in order to be absorbed. Um, it's, I think it's really interesting that the um, studies of different populations have actually shown that populations that um, that don't drink a lot of milk, you don't necessarily have a higher incidence of osteoporosis. And what they contribute that to is that, um, that populations that have a high intake of protein in the diet, um, a high level of protein can actually reduce calcium absorption. So it's good to not overdo the protein in our diet. And an example of how much um, protein would be recommended um, on a daily basis, in Canada's food guide, it suggests two servings from the meat and alternate group a day. And an example of a serving would be about this amount of turkey, so um, a couple, two or three ounces. Um, so getting getting a couple of servings uh, of um, meat, for instance, that are each about the size of a deck of cards or, or about the palm of your hand, two of those a day is plenty. In protein. Some people overdo the protein. It is important to get enough protein in the diet, but excess amounts can lead to um, more calcium being lost in the body and less calcium being absorbed. Caffeine can also reduce calcium absorption, so something to keep in mind for, for your tea and coffee drinkers. are some dietary risk factors too. We looked at genetic risk factors, some personal risk factors. And um, as far as diet goes, we'll, we'll just continue here. Is your diet low in calcium rich foods? So I'd like to spend some time talking about what foods have calcium in them. Uh, we always hear about the dairy group having a lot of calcium. And it is true, it's a very excellent source of, of calcium. Um, so, We'll talk about that in a moment. I'd just like to go through these other dietary risk factors first, and then we'll focus specifically on calcium. Um, in order to get the calcium we need, it's approximately two servings from the milk group is recommended. Um, the next question is, do you consume more than two alcoholic drinks per, per day? Um, and an example of one drink would be 12 ounces of beer, or four ounces of wine, or one and a half ounces of hard liquor. I see a lot of you shaking your hand. That's good. Because um, that also reduces um, calcium <coughs> absorption. Um, now, vitamin D is important um, for the metabolism of calcium. And um, we can get the amount of vitamin D that we need in a day by drinking a glass of milk, for instance. Okay. Fish also contains vitamin D. Um, and with the sun shining, now our bodies will will produce its own vitamin D by being exposed to the sunshine. Uh, but on the other hand, too much vitamin D can interfere with calcium metabolism too. And it suggests that an excess amount would be 800 international units of vitamin D per day. Um, that can interfere with, um, with calcium absorption. So keep that in mind. 
Okay, now let's, do, let's talk specifically more about um, high calcium foods. We often hear about um, the dairy products. So we've got our milk. Um, milk has about 300 milligrams of calcium in it per cup. And um, for those of you who find that your milk goes bad, you know, if you're, you keep buying it and, and it's in the fridge for a long time, you can try to buy smaller amounts. But something that's useful is um, to buy cans of evaporated milk, and they do come in smaller containers. I tend to have the smaller containers on hand at home in case I do run out and I want to add it to something. It's, it's really handy. Also, powdered skim milk um, is very handy to have too, and it tends to be cheaper than fluid milk. And it's a nice way to add um, calcium to your diet by adding it to um, soups and sauces and, and to your baking. It's a nice thing to bake with. Because it's less expensive than fluid milk, usually, um, it, I, I tend to bake, use it for baking. So just because you don't really know what's the difference in the flavor. And there's also another one um, that you might be aware of, and that's UHT milk. Have any of you heard of UHT milk? Nope. No. Okay. Um, you'll find it on the shelves in the grocery store, uh, and you might be surprised that it's not um, in, in the section where the refrigerator is. And what UHT stands for is ultra high temperature. And they processed it so that it can be stored, it's in a carton, and it can be stored on a shelf. Um, so if you're going camping or, or just in, in your emergency shelf at home, you might like to have some on hand. Um, so I just thought I'd let you know about that. Um, other sources of calcium would be yogurt. Okay, yogurt is an excellent source and tastes really good. Um, with breakfast or in milkshakes, if you like to, to blend up a drink in the blender with some fruit, it tastes really nice. Um, I like yogurt on pancakes and French toast too. Okay. Um, or on baked potatoes too, plain yogurt. It tastes really good. Now, um, cottage cheese isn't as good of a source of calcium as your, your milk and hard cheeses. It takes about a couple of cups of calcium to give you the amount of calcium from from a cup. So it does provide calcium, but just realize that it's not as high in calcium as, as um, your harder cheeses. Okay, this is an example of one ounce of cheese. About one and a half ounces of cheese has the same amount of calcium as a cup of milk does, for instance. Okay, so cheese is a good source. It tends to be pretty high in fat, so if you're concerned about your fat and calorie intake, you might be better off choosing getting your calcium sources from your um, lower fat milks. Now, a couple of things that aren't considered um, good sources of calcium that you might be surprised at are things like butter. It's a dairy product, but it's very low in calcium. Same with sour cream. It's not really a good source of calcium. And um, whipping cream, or your half and half cream, these are very low in calcium because they're so high in fat. It's fat that's that's, that's in here taking up all the space, <laughs> not a lot of calcium. And um, you might be surprised also to hear that coffee whiteners, like coffee meat, are very low in calcium too. They're really not comparable nutritionally to milk, so it's much better to add milk to your, to your coffee than, than coffee meat. Okay, um, if you're making soups at home, and um, if you don't like drinking fluid milk, you might think about adding milk to your soup instead of water. That's another way of getting more calcium in. Um, have any of you heard of ricotta cheese? That's a good calcium source. And you would find it in the same section as you would cottage cheese in the grocery store. And um, it's, I really like the flavor and the texture of it. It's nice and soft and it's spreadable. And I like having it lasagna. It's lower in fat than your hard cheddar cheese. And it, it adds a nice texture. What is it called again? It's called ricotta. Ricotta cheese. You see it in a lot of Italian dishes. Mm -hmm. Is it in any uh, store? Yes, yeah, I, I see it in, in most all the yeah, way to go. Grocery stores, yeah. 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 ravioli or What's that? You use it in? Ravioli. Ravioli, yes. Yeah, Frank says he uses it in ravioli. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Yeah. Good source of calcium. Um, 
this um, type of cottage cheese can also be substituted um, instead of using cream cheese. Cream cheese is another one that's not really a good um, source of calcium. It's not as good as your heart cheeses. But in a, um, a recipe for cream, um, or cheesecake rather, um, this is a better choice because it's lower in fat, higher in calcium than your cream cheese would be. And you can also make dips and things with it too by adding different spices and spreading it on um, toast or crackers and that sort of thing. Okay, so these are all really good sources. And what I've talked about so far are the dairy sources. Um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about non-dairy sor sources. And I'll also give you an idea of how much of each of these different things you would need to get about the same amount of calcium as one cup of milk. Okay, so we're going to be comparing here some, some non-dairy sources. Okay, legumes, for instance, your beans, again, are a source of calcium. Um, and it, it would take about three cups of cooked beans to um, give you the amount of calcium as would be in one cup. Okay, so they are, they are a source. Um, let's see. Beans or other legumes too, like your lentils and that type of thing. Okay, sesame seeds. About three tablespoons of sesame seeds has the amount of calcium as a cup of milk. So they're an excellent source for those of you that don't like to drink milk. Three tablespoons. Um, almonds. How many of you like almonds? <laughs> they're pretty high in fat, that's the only thing. But a cup of almonds has about the, the same amount of calcium as a cup of milk. Okay. Um, seaweed. I don't know if any of you are familiar with using seaweed, um, but there are different types. Um, Kajiki or kelp, for instance, are fairly high in calcium. And um, let's see, your dark green vegetables. Now, I brought an example of one. Uh, anybody know what this is? You see, probably you've seen it in the grocery store. Yeah, no, it's not parsley, it's not cabbage, okay. no, no, no. kale. It's kale, that's right, K-L-E, kale. And um, a lot of people will cook it. It has a nice flavor to it. It looks like parsley, it's yeah. crunky, it's all curly. Um, but what I like to do with it is chop it up very fine and put it in a salad. It's a little bit coarse, otherwise it'd be hard to put it on a sandwich for us to eat it that way. Um, so if you're not cooking it, chop it up really fine and it tastes really nice. And fun. It's an excellent source of calcium. Um, so are some of your other dark green vegetables, such as broccoli or bok choy, um, kale, mustard green, okra, turnip greens. Um, let's see. One and a half cups of these dark green vegetables would give you about the same amount of calcium in a cup of milk. Okay. Now, just a couple of other things. Uh, two tablespoons of black strap molasses would give you the same amount as in a cup of milk. Um, five sardines or a cup of salmon. Now, that would be salmon with the bones because salmon, or because calcium is stored in the bones. Uh, if you're opening up your tin of salmon and you see some bones in there, try just mashing it with a fork and uh, it blends in really nicely. Okay, but uh, about a cup of salmon would have the same amount of 